Gig Gab, the working musician show for Monday, September 16th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include mintmobile.com slash gig gab. We'll tell you why you're going to go there shortly. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, Paul Kent. I, uh, it, so I don't know if anyone but me has noticed this. I think you probably have, folks. But uh, I'm really stoked that we are now recording in stereo as opposed to mono because uh, I like hearing the theme music in stereo when I play it every <laughs> week. So there you go. Plus, I've got you and I panned a little bit, Paul. In fact, I encourage you to listen to listen back to this week's episode and let me know what you think, too, because, you know, this is our product. And, and you know, so there you go. Separ- a little Sounds separation. good right now. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, but you wouldn't hear the stereo panning while we're recording. So, uh, oh, yeah. okay. right. So I'm just hearing the, the marvel, the marvels of Zencaster. You're just hearing the marvels of Zencaster. That's right, which is what we're using today to uh, to record the show because we were going to do an interview and then it uh, technology beat us uh, today. But that will not. We will. We actually have a few interviews scheduled and we will make them happen for you shortly. So. Yeah, yeah. We had good. promised last week that we're going to do a, a show on how to how to improve your chops. So I have a friend of mine who's a perfect person to talk about this. We wanted to have him on today, but technology gods weren't with us. But we'll we're going to get that sorted out. And we're going to get that hopefully in the next two weeks. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, where are we? Oh, I had a really weird thing happen last week, man. So we record this show on Monday, as as most of you know, because that's the day we try to release it, and then. Right after that, I got a text from my friend John McCormick, who's a guitar player that I've played with in a few different projects. He did Brick Tones with me. We did a run of uh, the Bitter Pill, the second run of Bitter Pill that we did. He played in and, and uh, we're, you know, we're both local rock musicians and, and have run into each other many times. And he texts me and he says, uh, hey, Dave, do you play congas? And I said, uh, well, I own congas and uh, I, I, you know, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether I can play them. And he's like, cool. He says, uh, I've been booked to play the opening of TEDx Portsmouth, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, doing a did last Friday, a big TEDx uh, thing. And uh, he's like, I've been booked to play the opening. The song that I'm doing would be is great to have congas. And I would love to have you play if you can do it. First of all, can you do the gig? Second of all, can you do a rehearsal tonight, like last Monday night? Uh, and then can you do sound check on Thursday night? Like, whoa, okay. So let's look at the schedule. Can I do Friday morning? Yes. Okay. What time's the gig? 9 a.m. Okay, cool. So we had to be there at like 7 30 or whatever, but that was fine. No problem. Monday night, which was the day we recorded the show and the day I was getting this this invitation to play, I had a fling rehearsal. Like the fling rehearsal is supposed to start at seven. I'm like, John, what time's this rehearsal for this one song? He's like, we're, we're going to go six to seven thirty, but we probably don't even need to, go, need to go that long. I'm like, okay, cool. Where? About 20 minutes from my house. Okay. So I text the fling guys. I'm like, Hey, I'm probably going to be, you know, maybe a half hour late, but probably not even that. And it turned out when all was said and done, I, I was here by like seven fifteen, which was good. And so I went and I show up at this rehearsal and on the way there, I'm listening to this song. Because it's an original tune that John had put together about a year, year and a half ago. He went to paint his house and got a paint color, you know, from the the store that he liked the name of. And he got it home and he hated the color of the paint on his walls. But he really liked the name of the color. And he thought, well, that, you know, the paints are named such cool colors. So he went and found like 15 more paint colors of which he liked the name and wrote 15 songs about just named the same as the paint color. They weren't about paint. It was just, you know, whatever the name in, uh, of the paint inspired in him, that was the song that he wrote. And then he actually did a full on, he wrote a story about this and did a full on theater show at one of our local sort of uh, up and coming th- theaters for up and coming artists. Like the, the players ring actually where I've done shows like, uh, like bitter pill and things like that. And we did brick tones there. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
And uh, and I am, went and saw that show, but I only saw it once. And so while I had heard, I'm sure I heard this song at the show, it was the first song of the show. And so, I, you know, like th- that stuff doesn't stick in your head when you're just an audience member. So anyway, mm-hmm. on the way to his house, I'm listening to the tune, getting a feel for, OK, here's how this works. I'm assuming it's going to be some acoustic kind of thing. We're just playing one song. So, OK, I see what the drums are doing. I'll approximate that on congas or whatever. OK, cool. So I get there and meet some of the other guys. You know, there were a few people there that I knew and some people that I didn't. And that was always nice to you know meet some new musicians. And uh, and then Rick, his drum set player from the paint box band that I saw and I've known for a long time, shows up. And it was like, oh, so there's actually he, like this is going to be a full band plus Dave on congas, not just Dave on congas. And Rick, of course, shows up and he had no idea who was going to be there either. And so he walks in. He's like, he looks at me. He's like, wait, am I fired? And like, I'm like, I don't know. What are you supposed to be playing? And he says, drum set. I'm like, good news. We're both still on. Like, so uh, so we rehearsed the tune three or four times and uh, and it was good to go. And then we actually got to rehearse it again on uh, Friday morning before the thing. They went and sound checked it on Thursday night, but I had a gig with Amanda Dane uh, on Thursday night, so I couldn't make the that. But it was just one of those things of, of being an on call sideman kind of thing that you don't know what you're going to get when you walk in. You don't. And, and you know, you don't know what you're going to get when your phone rings either. And uh, you know, I didn't know when we were doing the show that I was going to be able to be part of this really cool thing. And then the amazing part was, I feel like more people, I heard from more people about that one song that I played than I have, you know, any gigs I've played in the last month. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, this was a sold out house at the Portsmouth music hall. And I, evidently, there's a lot of people that I know that go to TEDx Portsmouth every year that got a lot of texts from them saying, hey, that was really cool. That song was awesome. Like, well, oh, that's cool. Yeah. OK, cool. Well, but, so you can relate to this talking about Sidemen walking in. So for the first time in a long time, we need a sub drummer for a gig. So we have two oh, gigs next weekend oh, and we have a sub drummer. I'm, so I'm busy. I can't I can't make it. Paul. <laughs> hey, you know what? I'll tell you what. It crossed my mind. Mm. It actually, it did cross my mind. But um, well, sir, I mean, you know, I'd love it if it, like, yeah, anytime, man. If, if we can make if it the, work, if the money was there, I would have made it work. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. Yep. So, um, it's a drummer I know that I've been playing kind of like low key gigs with. You know, I have like this little. I talked about this winery band that I have. This little kind of collection of friends of mine, and we go and we do these things, and it's yeah. really low key. And this guy's a very good drummer. Can He's I well ask? Who, can I ask area. who it is? I probably think I. I think I know him. Right. I don't think you've met Don. Don Frank oh. is his name. No, I've never met Don. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Don is, you know, he's been in the area. He has a great reputation, total pro. Sure. Uh, very solid guy. But, you know, walking into our gig is a little bit different. So walking into any gig where the stakes are, are not just what the stakes are for a pickup band in a club yeah. is, it, yeah, it matters. Yes. You have to prepare different. I prepare differently sitting in with a band like yours for a gig like yours than I would if somebody was like, Hey, I'm playing at the local dive where there's going to be, you know, 50 people there. Uh, here's a song list. Like we'll just bash it out and have fun. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Like that's it. There's two different gigs. You got to prepare. Differently. Yeah. Yeah. Well this, you know, we've talked about this in, in a few different ways over the years, but, but this is about as much of a true pro who does these kind of, you know, stand in gigs and is, has the capabilities to do them. Not the guys who think they can do them and have a certain tolerance for, failure you know like well it's just a sit-in gig you know, this is one of the it's probably one of the best guys i could get for this type of thing right right so don's you know he's got great chops total pro in his head and in his hands and so we started uh the process was i sent him our song list and said what of these do you know so we started there yeah and so he goes through the list and you know luckily you know and we it's not like you know we have some stuff well we have two things we have a lot of songs that other bands play for sure. Sure. We have a subset of those where we do something interesting to them. Um, and then we have a couple songs that aren't that common, you know, which is probably many bands, right? That, right. That's probably the formula that most bands have. Um, but we have the slight complication of having to keep 10 guys on the same page. So, you know, train wrecks are a little bit more painful because, uh, you know, when one guy thinks he's going to save the band from a, you know, from a train wreck, do the other nine guys follow? Or are they looking at me? Or, you know, it, it's a, it's a, you know, even though the general consensus is look at the singer and see where he wants to go, 
Um, and if the singer draws a blank, then it usually goes to me and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll signal for, you know, verse course or end or something. Sure. Like that. Anyway, so we have, we have this. So we start out with, he gets the list. He comes back. That's good. Um, he asked, do you have any live recordings? And yes, we, you know, now that we have this nice Midas board, we've been recording our shows and we have a nice little live recording. So I sent him a live recording that has 75, 80% of the songs we're going to play that, you know, cause we're, we're going to start with the list of what he knows. Right. Right. And smart. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not, no great surprise, but that's the, that's the smart way to do it is okay. What do we have in common? Great. Those are definitely there. Now what yep. else do we need to fill it in? Yep. Right. And then, so those two steps happen. And then um, I asked Russ to go sit with him because Russ has charts. Some of Russ's charts are in Russ, Russ hand, you know, that, that mean are meaningful to him. Like you, like yours were exactly the same way, right? Yeah. You, you asked me when Russ joined the band, you're like, do you have charts? I'm like, well, <laughs> I, yes, but, but they're only good for one brain that I know of. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so Russ, but Russ, you know, being the guy that Russ is, he went and sat with him and went through stuff, shared charts, kind of talked about the unique things. So that's step three. And then today I kind of went through, I d- did the set list well in advance. So he knows exactly what order things are going on so he can get his notes in order. And then I just kind of highlighted the songs that I know I'm going to have the gotchas. So I said, here's the ones that we, I want to just make sure that we have a plan on. So let's talk it through or sit together this week and just, what do you think is going to happen there from what everything that you've learned in the first three steps of this and how do we smooth out the rest? And, you know, I imagine there'll be some stuff despite all good intentions. And again, you know, Don is, is a prep guy. Um, despite all good intentions, he'll just play things straight through something and oh, know, yeah. it'll sound different. Nobody will know, but us. It'll be and, fine. You know, yep. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, but he's going to walk in and, and uh, this is a guy who's good at walking in and it'll be really interesting to me to hear what he, what he thinks. Well, that's, I mean, that's uh, the trick is having, you know, what you just said there is this is not his first, it's his first time playing in that band. Thankfully, it's not his first time playing with you, but it's also not his first time walking into a gig somewhere. So he knows, it, you know, I, I, for a, in a lot of scenarios, one of my default catchphrases is it's all about learning how to live with yourself. Right. And this is one of those scenarios where he knows what he needs to do. Hopefully he will do it. Right. I mean, you know, there's, there's a difference between being aware and then taking action. And I'm not saying anything about Don. I'm more reflecting on myself. But, you know, it's like he knew he knows what he needs to do to make this work. And that's different from what I might need to do or, you know, somebody else might need to do. You, you know, you know yourself, you know where you can trust yourself to wing it and where you shouldn't trust yourself to wing it. And then yeah. you go and, you know, you, you figure it out. Yeah. And then like when you sat in with us, you know, fortunately, my bass player knows everybody's parts and, you know, really has a great command of everything that's going on. And that's the guy who's going to get Don through this. And that yeah. was the case when you sat in with us, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, I, Steve, I'm, Steve a, I'm of a certain amount of help to you, but the bass player you know, I'm busy fronting the band, right? Facing the audience. Yeah. So Steve is really the one who's, who's providing the nuance and the, yeah, and the he countdown acted, the times. He and, and at some level, Nick acted as what I, in the role that I would call the music directors, right? Like they yeah. were the guys that were like, all right, here's how this is going to go. Watch me. Yeah. I I will get you through this. And, and yeah, it was probably 80% of the time it was Steve, maybe 70% Steve, 30% Nick was kind of how that, that worked out and it was fine. And I knew to trust them. And thankfully I already knew those guys. I'd even played with them with you before. So mm-hmm. it was like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is no problem. So no. Yeah. Yep. So it'll be interesting. It, it, one of the gigs was, is um, a gig. It took me a long time to get into. It's a really popular festival that I've been battling with for probably 13 years. And so I wanted to try and minimize the risk, right? Yeah. So luckily, you know, I think all this prep is going to get us most of the way there and having a guy with good big ears is going to get us most of the way there. But um, I think we have pretty safe set lists. You know, it's not going to be the most, the most no. explosive dynamic thing, but you got to kind of, you know, when you're, when you're, you know, star offensive lineman is, is hurt. You don't run over that hole. Right. <laughs> so. Right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. That's good, man. That's good. Yep. That's good. Hey, uh, I, I want to talk you before we started the show, you were telling me about a scenario that you have and I'll let you explain why you're there. But but you are looking at a at a future where you might have to sort of recreate your your base clubs that you play in. And I want to have this yeah. conversation because 
I, if you haven't been there in your band yet, you probably will be someday. Uh, I've certainly been there in diff- with different bands because this stuff happens. So I want to have that conversation because I think it's an interesting one. But first, yeah. I want to talk about our sponsor today, which is Mint Mobile. We've talked about this before. If you are still using one of the big wireless providers here in 2019, have you asked yourself and have you really looked at what you're paying for? Between all their expensive retail stores, all their inflated prices and hidden fees, you're probably being taken advantage of because they know you'll pay. And this creates an opportunity. And this is the opportunity that Mint Mobile has now filled because Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage they're used to. They're a T-Mobile MVNO, which means they use T-Mobile's towers, but they control the entirety of your experience. And it's so good. They can do it at a fraction of the cost because everything with Mint Mobile is online. You save on those retail locations, all the overhead, and then they pass that savings directly on to you. I've been using this. It's freaking amazing. We've had other listeners writing in telling us how well it's working for them, how surprised we all are. It's one of those things I will say when they first came and talked to me about this, I was like, this seems too good to be true. And and so I, I know what you're thinking. I felt the same way until they proved me that it's not too good to be true. It's too good and it's true. So you got to check this out because you can cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. And I know we all want to save money. It's incredible. Yeah. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. And with Mint Mobile, you get to also stop paying for unlimited data. You don't use unlimited data. You use a certain amount of data. And so you can choose a plan That has three, eight or 12 gigs of 4G LTE data per month. And then you buy in bulk. And that's how you can really, really save. Like, it's crazy. Use your own phone or you can get phones from them. But check it out to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month. That's where it all starts. And get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash gig gab. That's the where you get this deal. Mintmobile.com slash gig gab. G-I-G-G-A-B. That's how that works. Yep. Cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gig gab. And our thanks to Mint Mobile for sponsoring thanks, this episode. Mint Mobile. Yeah. All right, man. So talk All to right. me. What, what uh, happened? Uh, tell me what ha- tell Tell everyone, if you wouldn't mind, right. what happened? So what is the famous John Lennon quote? Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Yeah, that is. Yes, that applies so well to this situation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, you know, then the other one, us certainly being in the tech industry have experienced this, but Murphy is always on the payroll. Murphy's law is always right around I, the corner. I right? always say Murphy's on my speed dial. I guess I should, <laughs> I guess I should put it as Murphy's on my favorites list because speed dial is one of those things. I think that's a term that kids, you might have to ask your parents about, but yes, fair, fair. I, I understand the reference, sir. Yes. So I've made reference to this often that uh, pretty much in the winter, and then we pick it up again in the in the mid late fall. We play clubs. We don't play clubs the rest of the year um, because we have a good number of outdoor gigs and private gigs. You know, our summers are usually busy with those types of things. Our springs and summers are usually busy with those types of things. Our springs and summers and early falls are usually busy. But um, we have three clubs that we've been working with for quite a few years. One is in my hometown, the where I live, and I would say it's our base. One is. Um, about 40 miles away and they um, gave us a gig very early on in the history of the band and it's turned into a regular gig and we built a great audience there. Um, And then the other one is about half hour away over at the beach. um, Another club that, you know, has always been very good to us, you know, of those three, all three within the matter of days have gone into question. And here's the story. So, uh, I was told last time we played the club, it's about 40 miles away. It's called Main Street Brewery. Um, the the owner pulled me aside and said, hey, you know, are you available New Year's Eve? Um, it might be our last show here. I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, you know, I think it's time. And so he just caught, and we were already booked for New Year's Eve. And so I said, oh, we can't. But, you know, if you want to do a big clothing thing, we would love to be, you know, part of, you know, a farewell because you guys have been so good to us. And so that club, he let me know is, you know, probably not going to be around next year, whether he's going to sell to someone else who's going to keep us or whether it's just going away entirely. I don't know, but it's definitely in flux. Then the club in my town, um, 
again, he, right around this time of year, I come out of the summer and I'm starting to think about first quarter next year. And this club actually usually September, October, I book the entire next year in one shot. I just send them the dates and, you know, we're good. And this has been going on for years. And I got a message back saying, you know, I don't know what's going to be going on next year. I, I actually, this time I can't commit to it. So that was kind of troubling. That one's up in the air. And before either of these two things had happened, the guys have been talking about the the club at the beach that maybe maybe that's not one for us. We're planning enough where we you know we can be a little bit more choosy. Uh, we were planning enough where we could be a little bit more choosy. And um, that gig is kind of late, you know, really kind of below the scale that we've been getting in most other places. But again, they were good to us when we started, and we've gone a long time there. And you know, we've made them a lot of money. We've brought some good crowds there. And sure. And but if we were going to let one go, that one because it's far, it's late, far enough. It's late. It's um uh and you know a little bit below our scale, what what we consider our scale right now. Sure. But all this happened in the course of a week to, t- to ten days. I mean, we started out talking about we had the luxury of of passing on the one place, and then the other two conversations happened in short order after that. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at like, well, I I don't have a lot booked for the first quarter of next year because we always count that these things were going to happen. You know, keeps us. Some of them are every month, some of them are every six weeks, but you no, know, there was certain, you know, rhyme and rhythm to our, to our patterns. We could try out the new material, you know, perfect the show as we get ready for the spring and summer, but be careful what you're sure of because it could, the rug could be pulled out from under you as quickly as possible. So I am right now trying to get clarification on all three. Some, you know, the one from the band, you sure you want to punt on this, right? Uh, there was another club in our town that um, again, it's late. Um, it's an upstairs load in with a really janky elevator that sometimes doesn't work, you know, but they, they've they wanted us and we've been like, Ugh, you know, that's, that's a, a 1.30 AM gig. We haven't really done those in years. Um, and uh, uh, you know, probably okay pay, not great pay, but okay pay. But the guys had said, no, we don't need that. We have the other club. Well, now we don't have the yeah. other club. So I'm interested to see if the band will, will want to, you know, move over given the other constraints. Um, but you know, it's that type of thing and everything to me, like as a leader of a band, it all feels like it's strung together with a really fragile thread, you know, be careful, right. You, you know, cause like this, all three gigs of those could go away and we will have to start recreating. And the problem is we have good bases in those places. There are other clubs in those bases, but you know, I'd have to break into those clubs. I'd have to, you know, say, Hey, they don't want us anymore. You know, do you want it? Or that's not happening anymore. Do you want us? Yeah. Or yeah, that's like yeah. The, the, the one. I have a lot of things to say and I've actually been taking notes, but I, I will interject on that one. It, the sales pitch thing is to do exactly what you did and, and correct the pitch. Not that they don't want us anymore. That's ending. There's an opportunity for you club owner at club B for us to be playing your club instead. Right. Right. Don't say they don't want us anymore. No, 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 no. I, I know you know that. I'm just kind of highlighting that to the folks here. Like do that in your inside voice and, and then, you know, <laughs> and then say it out, say the right thing out loud. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. And then the other clubs that we have like tangential relationships are in towns where we don't have great draws. So, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's time for us to roll up our sleeves and develop because they're good clubs. They're nice places. One is a, a, a part of this area where we don't get enough work, where we should get more work. And so maybe it's time to take that gig and, you know, be much more conscientious about, about a marketing campaign and build it up again. Right. You know, yeah. just get that thing going. I mean, that's how that one, the one that's about 40 miles away, you know, we started, we, nobody knew us. And just it, the hard thing is you, you need, you need a commitment from the club to kind of give you some regularity. Cause it's so hard if you're only there every four five, six months, nobody remembers you. from. Oh the yeah. Last no, time, you're, right? you're just, you're just filling space. If you're there every four or five, six months, you need to, Really be there every month in order for that to work. And six weeks at the latest. And honestly, you know, this is the time of year, folks, whether or not you feel like you have to rebuild. Hopefully you're not in the scenario that Paul's in and with, you know, multiple clubs sort of dropping like flies. But uh, now is the time to start talking with the clubs that you either are in, but maybe weren't there regularly. Maybe this was the year that you did get the once every four month sort of fill in random gig. Somebody's going to fall off the schedule. Be talking to them. Do not wait for them to call you. Tell them, Hey, look, we really like playing your club 
and it things always work out well there. If you've got a slot in your regular rotation, please think of us because that is the thing that will plant the seed in your head when they look and they say, I have a spot in my regular rotation. Nobody wants to go take the hard route, right? And the hard route for them is crap. I have to think of a band. If you've already told them who the band is and it's yours, boom, they will put yeah. you in that slot. So, well, I'm going to give you an example of the, the one club that we have one of those tangential relationships with. It's a great club. It's a beautiful club. They, it, they do it on a, on a, a split of ticket sales, but it's a very generous split of ticket sales. Um, it's a great club, but they're really smart owners. I mean, they're very experienced club owners. So they have um, three promoters who basically take one Saturday night a month there and it's their gig. And, you know, they had to prove that they would be able to fill it with whatever they do. So three outside booking people, promoters yep. who take one Saturday a month, that leaves one Saturday a month for the club owner himself to book. And so that's rare inventory. And he also said that that one Saturday month that is his to book, he's got a certain number of bands that kills it. He said he has an 87% sellout rate and, you know, they're, they're on it. They know their numbers. They know, they know, they know what they're doing. Yeah. They know it. And I actually entirely respect that. And so even though, you know, I'm sure on this show, I, I come out as, you know, pretty, a lot of bravado and I'm proud of my band, you know. I have to be humble. Last time I played there, we did so-so. We didn't we didn't kill it. And so I can't go to a guy who's filling his club pretty regularly no. and say, well, you haven't seen my fastball, right? Uh, actually, so. I have, but also I don't care because I've seen that <laughs> yeah. guy's fastball and it's all it's I need. Faster. Yep, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I said, hey, you know, are Fridays easier? You know, I'm, I'm willing to take that road to take Fridays. Yeah. You know, I can still make a Friday work and let me build it up and then we can get to Saturdays. And he was like, you know, that's working with me. That's cool. And then... um we talked about opening acts. So he goes, you know, I would love to bundle you with someone else that will help take some of the burden of the draw off of you. Mm. But you guys are such a big band. It really eats up a lot of time to do a changeover. So it's a hard thing to do. So I don't know. I actually love your opinion about this. I was wondering, I could find a friend band who could use our backline. That's one option. I could find an acoustic. Well, hang, hang on. You know what? Because I want to talk about some of this other stuff. And then let's talk about the opening act thing. Sure. Yeah, because there's 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 some things to unpack here. So mm -hmm. um, going to back to sort of the beginning of what you were talking about here, you know, you've got one club that uh, you've got you've got several scenarios where th the the momentum is towards you're losing these three clubs. Right. But one of them is for initiated by you. Right. Your your band in general. And I will warn all of the. Uh, side men out there to be sensitive to the fact that these gigs don't all come easy. You said, you know, everything hangs by a fragile thread. I would say that most people, it, it, it's probably true that most people in your band don't quite understand how fragile that thread is only because they're not the ones on the front lines doing it. You're the one on the front lines doing it. Right. Right. And and so it's easy to and I say this for, to, directly from personal experience. It's really easy to sit there and say, oh, yeah, you know, that club, the load in there, I have to park around the corner and then I got to move my car. And, I, God, you know, yeah, I'd much rather just play at the place where I can just back up to the stage and, you know, have my drum set up in my van and just play from there and then close my van at the end of the night and go home. Right. You know, like that doesn't actually exist, but that would actually be pretty cool. Uh, it's really easy when you've got lots of gigs going on to start getting picky and saying, can't yeah, cancel the one with the, with the stairs, forget that. Yeah. We never want to right? super easy. And yeah. I am often the first guy to say those kinds of things <laughs> because you know, it's like, Oh crap. Like why would we want to do the hard gig when we could do the easy gig? Well, the reason is that the easy gig, neither of those gigs is going to last forever. The problem is you don't know which one is going to end first unless you choose. And then you are guaranteed that the other one will end second. And so you have to be very careful uh, how picky you get and and where that pickiness, what the foundation of that pickiness is from. You know, if you've got 10 clubs and there's one that you don't like, OK, great. Let that one club go. We've got these other nine. We know that two of these other nine are also going to fall off, but that still leaves us seven. Right. You have to assume that if you tell one club to pound sand for a different reason that is completely out of your control, at least one other club, if not more, are also going to tell you to pound sand 
perhaps through no fault of your own or perhaps very much through fault of your own. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, things happen. Right. You know, the, the next gig could be a disaster. There could be a big fight. And the owner now equates you with that fight and th they don't want you back. You know, and you're like, I didn't start. I was on stage, man. I was the one that was out of it. It doesn't matter. You know, those kinds of yeah. things can happen. So I've learned to be very careful and be very reserved about stating my opinion because I can be a very persuasive guy and it's not difficult for me to convince four other guys in a band of five, including the one that's doing the booking that we should no longer play a club because the, you know, the, 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 the stairs are too steep and they didn't, you know, pour my drink with the right amount of ice or whatever. Like it doesn't matter. I know I can convince a band to do this and that's dangerous. So be yeah. careful what you, what dissension you choose to foment. <laughs> it, and that goes for almost every aspect of being in a band, right? It I mean, does, I mean obviously totally. it, it is a very tactile problem when it comes to gigs because it does yeah. affect other guys' pocketbooks. And, you know, and when I say this fragile thread, the, the deal, I've said this many times to you, the basic premise I had from the moment I started the band was keep the band working, keep the guys busy and yes. their attentions will be on your project. Once you kind of spray it out and you don't play for a couple months at a time, my guys they're, they're, they're musicians. They want to play. They will find, even if their heart, you know, or their head is like, Oh, I'm in the house rockers. Well, we haven't played in a while. I'll, yeah. I'm just going to go sit in with these people or, 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 you know, the, ah, there's a little bit more work over here. And all of a sudden the whole house of cards can fall. So luckily, That's right. and, and you know, you, you are aware of that as the band leader, as a side man, you also have to be aware of that because if you're the one that's sort of unraveling it by pulling on the thread and saying, we don't need that gig. We don't need that gig. Now you're going to be playing less frequently. I, I talk about chafed. I loved those chafed gigs. Uh, you know, John sort of lost interest in booking and playing with the electric band. And so he, we don't like that. That band doesn't gig when that band was gigging. If John called me and said, Hey, I've got a gig on, you know, such and such a Saturday night, I would feel obligated to say yes to that gig because we were playing regularly and everybody was relying on that, and I can't be the one to disrupt that. But if John called me now and said, hey, I might have a chafed gig, it would be like, all right, can, does that conveniently fit into my schedule? Or do I have somebody else that I'm, that, you know, that, that might want me that night that I am playing with regularly? Sure. And I don't want to disrupt that one because that's the one that my loyalty is to. Now, why is my, it's not because I've known Guy B longer than I've known John, because that's probably not true. I've known him longer than I've known most people, you know, so uh, it's loyalty comes. Loyalty is is a very fluid thing. And I don't say this. I, I mean, I'm very aware of it. This is a very self-aware thing. It's, but, you know, if if I'm playing regularly, say, with Uptown Celebration, well, then that's the band that's going to get my first call, like that. They get first right of refusal on those nights. And but if Uptown isn't playing all that much and it doesn't take long, maybe, you know, three, four, five, certainly six months off done that the band is, you know, there's somebody else at the top of the list now. And you yeah. have to be careful of, uh, and you have to be cognizant of that when you start thinking about all of this stuff. So, yeah. Well, the, the, the you surround that with, have you picked guys who have the same values for how much and how they want to play? Yes. Right. So right. again, I, I, I was careful that I picked guys. I told them, here's a situation. Here's what we're going to do. And then I had to go deliver it. So I had to find guys who wanted to gig. You know, my assumption is you're here. You want to spend your weekend playing music. You know, we're going to go for X amount of gigs a year, gigs a month, whatever it might whatever be. Whatever it is. Sure. And yep. yeah, there was an expectation set. You got kind of a verbal buy-in before you offered the guy a gig. And then as a leader, I had to go out and fulfill that. <laughs> you know, I, I made the promise. Now I have to go make that happen. So that's all on my mind as we're kind of going through this change, you know, uh, and there'll be a change. I mean, I, it, not all three of those situations are going to, you know, revert back to what they were. There's going to be at, at worst, one of them will go away. No, at worst, three of them will go away. At best, one of them will go away. Right. Yes, at best. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, I always say, and, and this is sort of my approach to business in general, is I know that I'm I'm going to lose one client, right? And, and it, like, that's just how it's going to be. Over the course of time, I will lose one client. Now, if all I have is one client, that's a dangerous position to be in. If I have 25 clients, that's not so bad anymore. Yeah. So, but you got to maintain all of And never have clients. too many friends. That you're, as the booking guy... That is your job to keep everybody in the mix of things. And even if you're going to you know, pull back from a club, 
you don't tell them you're going to pull back from clips. Uh, you know, yeah, we're a little bit more busy this year. I'm going to have a hard time finding dates, but we'll stay in touch. Yes. Just some kind of goodwill thing, you know, and hopefully you never have to have that kind of conversation. Why are you not playing my club or, or you know, why are you not booking us? You yeah. can never have too many friends when it comes to to a booking situation. No, if you, but I will say if you do have to have that that conversation about why are you no longer booking us? Uh, I had that with with an actually an ad agency recently. And uh, so it's same thing, just different product is really all it is. And I was talking to him and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, we haven't done a lot of business this year. That's my fault. You know, it, and I, I maybe actually Smart. in that in that case, I think th- it's certainly shared responsibility. I just wasn't calling them because we were busy doing other stuff, but they also weren't calling me. Right. But, you know, it's like, hey, we should get on each other's radar. Like we have some good stuff for each other here. Uh, there's there's there was no like falling out or anything. In fact, it was everything was hunky dory. It just, you know, the way circumstances were, it just sort of happened. And I was like, hey, it is. Go ahead. It is very smart for the guy who's a booking person just to send occasional notes to yes. all of your booking contacts and, hey, just want to let you know what's going on with the band. Hope you're great. You know, just just the courtesy of saying, you know, I want to know what's going on with you and I want you to be aware it's going on with me is a huge relationship builder. I'll give you a good example why that's uh, important. There's a there's a good club um, that's about 20 miles away from here. It's um, hard. It's in a kind of a remote area. And it's a little harder to fill. And the booking guy who had been there had been there for a really long time. The club has changed over two or three times. And this guy got recruited to another club that is a little bit of a better situation. Ha ha. Right. So, the you know, booking people, you know, they have their Rolodex of bands and they have some knowledge of the industry. They know who sells, who doesn't sell. They can also, you know, move over places and you want them to take you with them. When they Absolutely. Do yeah, oh, yeah, that's that's exactly right. So you were saying it's good to be in touch on a regular basis. I, there are two pieces of advice I can give about that. Number one, put it on your calendar once a quarter to just send an email or a text or, you know, however you communicate with each of the booking people that you work with. It, send them all on one day. Take, you know, an hour, it won't take you more than an hour to do this. Right. But maybe it will. Maybe it takes a couple hours. Just send them all a note. And I keep a spreadsheet of what I call RFCs, reasons for contact. Anytime I think of a good reason to talk to someone about whatever the business is, I put it on the sheet. And now when it comes time to do that, I can look at the sheet and be like, all right, what did I send them last time? Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll do a different thing this time. Like maybe it's, hey, you know, my band put out this EP that that's pretty cool. I thought you might want to know about or some piece of news that's related to the the industry that you you aren't texting or emailing them asking when they will book you next you are texting or emailing them being their industry partner slash friend that has something to say and it might be something about you it might be something about them it might be you know something that's related for both of you but just staying remind i always say it's this is how we remind each other that we're human beings you know yes. and it's so important it, and it works. i send so what I send is I always send a thank you for a gig. I always, the next day or two days, I say thanks for the gig. Hope it went good for you guys as well. Um, you know, hope everybody liked the band. That, that's just kind of a standard thing. Yep. I send something at the end of the summer that says everybody who we worked with this year, you get first shot at your rebook dates until usually till October 1st. So yeah. I have a month, right, where I say, hey, you guys get that. You know, it, it's amazing the response I get to that. I always send a holiday greeting. And then occasionally just, you know, if there's a reason to reach out, you know, if we have like a cool video or something, just want to share you, let you know. And, and you know, the, the people who book us all the time, they might get a smile out of it. They might just chuck it right away. Yep. But the, if nothing else, for the people who don't book us all the time, it lets them know that we're professional and on our top of our game. And it's indicative of the way that we'll will work to have a good gig with them when we go into their club or to their wedding or to anything like that, that we're we've got our stuff together. I, I would be surprised. I would not be surprised to hear that you are the only band that does that with those clubs. Really? I no, I don't think so. I think most people don't do that. But hmm. I, I, I would also not be surprised to, if, if in fact other bands do it. It's probably twenty percent. I, I don't think it's higher than that. I, I think you, you can instantly set yourself apart by doing exactly what Paul just described. And it, it you know, that's not that much. 
It's, it's, you know, to me, that's table stakes, right? But, but for most people think about this, you know, you're dealing with other musicians people that don't, maybe they don't think about it as much of a business as you do. It's really right. easy to separate yourself out because as, as we've said on, on many shows, especially, you know, for those of us that are playing in bands where you're out there playing basically the same cover songs as everybody else, you know, you're all competing for the same weddings or the same corporate gigs or wherever, how do you differentiate yourself? Here's where it is, folks. This is where it mm -hmm. happens. Yep. 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 It's part of the gig. It's part of the gig. Oh, yeah. All right. So you, uh, I, de I derailed us, but uh, I'm glad I did because we got through those reasons for contact, which was a nice little bonus. Um, opening bands. You wanted, you wanted, mm. you, ha you had a question, Mr. Mr. Kent. Well, so the, the set it up again. We are, we're a disaster because we have so many guys and, you know, our, we are a, a fragile group that if the way we leave the stage during sound check is not how we find it again, it takes us several songs to get back, you know, on track. So if anything changes, um, festival dates are disaster. We're trying to get this band on stage, other band off stage, us on stage and mic'd in 30 minutes is usually a, a, a loose, loose situation. But for this one club, you know, he wants us to be successful there. He said, I'd love to package you with someone else and take the responsibility of, of the draw, you know, help have you share that, but you guys are so big. I just don't know if we can do that. And so I had said, well, you know, three possible things. One, we have some bands that we trust that we know maybe they could sit on our back line. Yeah. That's one idea. Yep. Number two, you know, get a good, and I don't even know off the top of my head who this would be, but get a good solo or duo, you know, someone with a lot of energy. So not, you know, folk music, yeah, you know, rock and acoustic. Someone that matches yeah. us. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, even, would it be interesting in this day and age to get a comedian? I that okay. So I've I've done the comedian thing before. Um, and what's cool about a comedian is you can also have them do a short set during your set break, right? Because we it's, don't take breaks. Oh, this is a festival gig. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got no, it. no, no. It's a, it's a club gig, but it'll be about two and a half hours. So it'll be oh. two hours straight through. Yep. And then you know a little break, and then you know five minutes and two minutes, and then encores. Yeah. Right. 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 Encores. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it on on longer gigs where you would have a break in the middle, you can actually have the comedian come back, and that's sort of a nice thing to tell people. And I'll be back, mm -hmm. you know, at the thing. So that that can actually work. It has to be the right vibe of the club, though, because if it's truly like you know, loud rock club, especially at the start when the comedian would be doing, you know, his or her set that that's not going to work. Right. It, it, it needs to be. Well, the lights have to come down and it has to be a show. It can't it, just be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it has to be a show. It has to be a show. Right. So that works. Um, finding a band that you trust. Sure. Yeah. I mean, all the options you presented are good. I like the rock and acoustic thing because that allows you to basically set up and not move a thing and then right. they can just step around your stuff. Cause they don't need all that stuff. They just plug in and go. Um, so yeah, that I like that idea too. Um, another idea, if you want to be able to, if you want to make your band more flexible in that regard, you know, when Dan Meblin was on, he talked about sort of doing that with his band. Right. And, and they, the way they have their sound system set up, with their own mixer for their own ears and the tails that come out just that plug into the, the front of house so that their stage sound is the same, no matter where they are, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That would be the other way to do it. Cause he said he can get his band up and running in, you know, completely from bare stage and instruments in cases to ready to go in 45 minutes. Uh, because they, they, all they need to do is make sure the line checks work and they don't need to check monitor mixes or anything like that. Cause it's good to go. So, uh, and, and if you, if you were in a, you know, festival vibe or something, you could, you know, perhaps put one sure. drum set here, one drum set there. And now it's a very quick changeover kind of thing. So, uh, so that would be the other way to think about that. That's that's obviously a bigger investment doesn't make sense to do it for one gig. But if you're mm -hmm. looking to sort of pave that way, maybe the one gig is the excuse to to create that scenario. Good not, idea. not easy, though, because you've got to put everybody in your band on ears like that's table stakes for that. And that's. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> We've had that conversation. So, yeah. yep. Yep. It is. I've been best. loving not being on ears. I've had a, I've had a run of gigs over the past month that have been no ears. And I have been loving it. I mean, I just feel so connected. The, the, you know, the monitors have been just perfect. Bill's got me dialed in volume wise. It's just great. I mean, so right now I'm, I'm happy to put the ears away. 
Yeah, but see, here's, I think of, and I'm, I don't take this, this is my own judgment toward Mm -hmm. myself, but I have been obsessed with protecting my hearing since I was 14 years old. So, right. No, I know many people are. Yeah. And when I play a gig without ears, I I know exactly what you're talking about. That thing where it's like, oh, this is great. Like when the mix is Feel good. It. Yeah. Like yeah. the gig I did with Amanda the other night was an acoustic gig. And it's in that uh, the, the the place that has wing night on Thursdays. And it was loud on stage. And it was so loud that I should have been wearing earplugs. But I didn't have any with me because for acoustic gigs, I just usually don't bring them. And I was like, man, okay. And it, and I, uh, what I said to myself was, okay, this feels good, but, but it's like heroin, man. You can't keep doing it because it right. will, it will ruin the thing that you've worked so hard to protect. And I did, I left that gig with my ears ringing for the first time in, I don't know, you know, probably five years. Uh, so it, be, all I will say is, is be careful. If you, I will say this, if you're going, if you want to protect your hearing and you're not going to use ears for a gig, use earplugs. And, and for me, that's why it was so easy to jump to ears. Cause I was using earplugs for every gig since basically gig number one. So mm. it's so moving to ears was like, Oh my God, this is so much better. There's speakers inside these earplugs. Like that's an amazing <laughs> thing, but that it, it, you know, it's, it's just as weird getting used to playing with earplugs as it is with ears. It's a different thing, but it's just as weird. So, yeah. Cool. Yep. <sighs> yep. And I, and I thought we didn't have much to talk about today. Aha, 46 minutes later, my friend. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, that's what uh, I think that's what we got for the day, right? It's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Like, we'll work to get James Robinson on, talk about building your chops, and uh, and you have yeah. Fish's lyricist. Yeah. Tom Marshall, Fish's longtime lyricist, is, uh, is on the books. We just got to make sure we get the schedules right together, but hopefully uh, very soon within the next couple of weeks we should we should have tom on which which will be a blast he's a he's a really interesting guy i've had a couple of conversations with him about this and uh yeah he's a he's a good guy he does his own podcast if you want to hear directly from him you can go to under the scales.com i'm pretty sure that's it's, the name of the show is under the scales and i, I i'll put a link in the show notes if cool. if i have the the thing wrong but yeah no I, I, he's and he plays in his own band. And so he's got some different perspectives and that I want to explore. Like, well, obviously, you know, we'll talk about his relationship to fish and all that. Cause that's a big part of his music career. But, um, but I kind of want to peel back the onion a little bit too with him. So, yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's what we got for today. I don't. Uh, Good one, Dave. Yeah. Very much so, man. Very, very much so. Cool. Thanks so much for listening, folks. Hey, send us your reasons for contacting people so that we can all share our lists. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Really, just send us anything. We'd love to hear from you. That's good. What do you always say, Paul? I believe the phrase is, always be performing. <laughs>